All right, everybody. Hey, how's it going? Stephen Bauman here, and welcome to the part two of the Drawing Essentials series, a three-part series. This is going to be the second part. We're going to cover in this live stream intermediate bar drawings. We're going to cover advanced bar drawings, and also, depending upon the time that we have after all that, because believe me, there is so much to unpack in those first two sections, we're also going to get into a kind of Loomis light which is to say that uh, the Loomis technique or the Loomis method or the Loomis head, whichever you want to refer to it as, uh, has a lot of very complex ideas around it and a lot of different applications. I'm going to get into the parts of it that I think dovetail the best with all of the other lessons that I give in general. I think here that it's best to kind of start in the beginning. We have on the right hand side here what is known as the girl of the same. Actually, there's an interesting story behind this uh, barg, which is of a specific cast that is often used in, uh, in ateliers. Um, certainly, it was used at the Florence Academy where I studied and where I taught. Well, maybe I'll do like a really brief background on it. This is actually a, uh, a death mask of a young woman who was pulled out of the River Seine in France and uh, in the 19th century and a death mask was made of her and it was considered to be quite peaceful and quite beautiful as you can see for whatever reason it was very popular caught the public's imagination um, and so kind of has persisted in popular culture i chose it here because it is i think the quintessential intermediate barg which is to say that uh, we started out in a place this was the first barg that i um that i talked about when we were doing the kind of part one lecture i kind of broke this one down i talked about kind of angle breaks and straight lines talking about the shadow shape talking about the half tones talking about transitions in between shadow and light all these things were kind of subjects and now what we're going to be doing is trying to create a narrative and understand how one of these kind of leads to the other. One of the biggest changes that we're going to have here really is the realization actually of the light shape. So the light shape in this particular bar, right, here and here, we have some differences in value. We have a little bit of half tone that kind of rides the edge of the, the light shape here and rides the edges of the light shape here as well. Let's take a look at the half tone in this particular bar, right? Look at the transitional nature of it, how it goes from lighter values, darker midtones, very dark values, which in fact, of course, are separate from that shadow value. The challenge that you're starting to face here is to have a much more difficult time differentiating in between the darkest half tones and the actual value of the shadow shape where the shadow lives. This is something that distinctly prepares you for life in the three-dimensional world, which is to say, when you're looking at the actual physical cast that you're going to be drawing, uh, which is what these uh, projects are a preparation for, you're going to have to make your own decision about where that shadow line is. So Barg in these projects is kind of pushing you further to try to understand how to make that call, right? Shadows will be designed one way, half tones will be designed a totally different way, right? We're going to assign an edge quality. Oftentimes I talk about that edge quality as being kind of binary, right? So binary is like a computer language, so you have one or you have zero. It is one or it is the other. There is not a third option. There is not a, a space in between where we kind of blend the two. We can say either it's a one or it's a zero. So in this bar, I think the first thing that we uh, start to establish is, is it a one or is it a zero? Is it a shadow edge or is it a half tone? That is a, a whole layer of categorization that you have to go through uh, in this process. And as I said, massive difference there between kind of beginning early bargs and the kind of later, much more advanced bargs. If there's a phrase that you want to like hold in your memory, and I'm big with these, right? Because a phrase that you can really memorize and meditate on, I think is, is a really powerful way to like encapsulate a concept that you have to use in drawing. So the phrase is soft but specific. It basically means that when we lose that sense of like hard contrast, we cannot lose our sense of design, right? So I talked about this shape because I think it's, it's very characteristic for this bar. And I talked about how if you outlined it like this, right? And I'm kind of outlining what I think is the 
consistent central value, which is maybe like a value three. If I search for all the places where I find that kind of consistent value three, it's going to create a, a boundary or a border somewhat like this. That, of course, we have to kind of translate into, um, instead of simply a specific shape, right, we need to make that soft. That's going to entail, of course, the use of angle breaks and essentially line segments, right? So line segments and angle breaks, just like we use when we're creating a simply a specific shape as we're doing here in this uh, in this block in but we need that kind of edge to be effectively transitional now something you'll hear me say talking about like more advanced drawings is that essentially everything in a drawing is a kind of transition and once you start to accept and realize that your value drawings will go much smoother i know that for me you know i spent a long time in this phase where i would kind of add edges to my halftone shapes in an effort to be specific I would I would then make them sharp so I was doing all the specific I was doing none of the soft and so my drawing stayed in this kind of middle phase for a very long time unresolved right uh, if you feel like in your work you get this very unresolved feeling whether in paintings or in drawings take a look at your halftone shapes and ask yourself the question uh, are you fulfilling both of these criteria very often uh, we find ourselves in this place where we're satisfying only one and not the other. Now, the flip side of that coin, of course, can be just as detrimental to uh, creating a really nice drawing, and that is if you manage to make your shapes quite soft, but you lose all sense of design inside of them. Let's look at what is called the flow of light. If we travel outward from this center light here, across the form, now the light source here, of course, it has to be said, is coming from uh, above, three quarters coming into the face, leaving these planes here to be the ones um, obviously most directly or most immediately facing that light source. Uh, so a lot of the gradations that you find are going to darken as they move away from that center light plane. So outward from the center light, we move downward towards here. Let's take a couple different pathways. Let's also go across here. You see that boundary that we're facing right here. And I'm gonna zoom in on this, on this area of the cast and we're gonna take a really close look at it. Looking at that passage that I just pointed out, we can see really quite clearly where the boundary in between shadow and light is. It becomes very ambiguous right through here. So what we have to do, and by the way, of course, it returns on this side, and I think basically there's two very ambiguous edges to the shadow, here and here. In both places, they are accompanied by a plane that is turned obliquely in relationship to the light source. So here we have these very dark halftone planes that are accompanying the shadow edge and thus making, like I said, that ambiguity to where the, the ending of that shape is. Up until now, this cast, of course, is the most complex thing that we've looked at, and it gives us, our, of course, our most complex vision of this, uh, of this particular kind of visual problem. What I like to do, though, is to try to run my eye across an unbroken pathway of light, right? So uh, as we kind of travel across this form, you can see all of the transitions are, are relatively soft, relatively fluid. When we come through here, of course, we find that hard stoppage. Now, let me just erase all of my kind of scattered lines here. I want to talk about that one more time, right? So here we have that hard stoppage. Here we have a flow of light. So that means, of course, that this section of the form is illuminated by that primary light source. When we get to here, that form is turned sufficiently away from the light source that we have a shadow edge. The same thing is happening right through here, and now we are kind of fulfilling what essentially the Barg drawing was trying to teach us, right? It was trying to set up a challenge for us to understand where the flow of light was and where the actual shadow shape was. So Sampo Peltola is asking the question of which three casts I would recommend to somebody who's investing in casts for the purpose of study. Well, you want something that is going to mirror essentially your progression through the BARG program. So you would like to have a beginning, intermediate, and advanced. I would recommend that you start out with the feature of the eye. There's a few different kind of feature casts that you can get. Uh, there's lips, there's a nose, there's an eye. 
I tend to favor the ear and the eye just because I think they're full of some interesting and kind of complex shapes. The lips and the nose to me are maybe slightly too generic or oversimplified to be massively interesting to draw. And you're going to want to be very interested because your, your first cast drawings, of course, are going to be very challenging. And I find that that relationship in between inspiration and your ability to push through a drawing uh, is very kind of tightly linked. So I'd start with the eye or the more organic looking ear. After that, you're going to want a mask. Now the reason that you want a mask is because there's a little bit less depth in it. And representing depth is its own kind of challenge in terms of kind of complexity. So the next one we go to is a mask. The one that goes through everybody's experience, I, I feel like if you've been through the academy and you haven't managed to draw this, then something happened that was horribly wrong, <laughs> or there was some uh, massive coincidence, is the uh, cast of Beethoven. It's often referred to as Beethoven's death mask, but I've heard recently, I can't substantiate, but I've heard recently, that it's actually not a death mask, it was a life mask. So, the mask of Beethoven is what I refer to it now, as you may hear it referred to as Beethoven's death mask. That's fine, we're really talking about the same thing. That one I would recommend. The Girl of the Seine, the one that I started out this lecture about, is technically an intermediate cast since it is a mask, but I think it's really, really organic. I think the shapes in it are really, really super specific, and depending upon your level, maybe you could find actually it's a little bit too challenging to be an intermediate cast. I think that the judgment just depends upon you there. You can also take Let's see, I'm actually looking at some of the casts that I have right now on the wall behind the camera. There's another one that is a mask that I actually wouldn't recommend as an intermediate, so the second of the three casts you would buy. There's one uh, of a guy, an old guy with a long kind of flowy beard full of gesture. Looks like a Bernini sculpture, uh, essentially. It's often referred to as Saint Jerome, though in fact it's not Saint Jerome. It's uh, of a different sculpture. Uh, this one... I think, though it's often used as intermediate, it's like what a very ambitious intermediate student does is they ask for the Jerome mask uh, because it's beautiful, it's complex, and if you pull it off, it's a really great drawing. But like I said, uh, I think it's a little bit too challenging. Uh, I would recommend that maybe for the third cast that you do or the, the more advanced one that you buy. If you're looking for an advanced uh, cast, there's a lot of them that you can choose in general, at the Academy, what would happen is your third cast on white paper, you had this selection that you could do like a full standing figure. So there is um, one such sculpture called the Bather that I know as in Tor Larsen's collection, which is really, really complex, really beautiful. It's just a great cast like in general. Uh, I own one. I don't even use it for drawing. I just have it like in the window. It's very attractive. Uh, but it's very, very large. So if you're planning to do these drawings life size, uh, that might be a little bit out of, your, um, out of your range. But I would select something for the advanced bar, or sorry, I would select something for the advanced cast that was in fact very complex and preferably a head in the round or in depth, right? That way you can turn that cast around. You can look for a lot of different variations inside of it. Uh, you can light it from a lot of different direction. Masks, of course, kind of have to be lit from somewhere along 180 degrees. When we look at this bar, the first impression has to be what happened to that whole shadow is atmosphere, light is form thing that we used to talk about, right? When we look at this section of the bar, and when I did this bar, I remember equally being kind of totally intimidated by it, but it seems to be completely broken up. It seems to be so full of variation that it defies the very idea that we started out this entire journey on. I can pick out, you know, six or seven different values just on their own, not even to mention like the actual linear properties inside of this, that even when there isn't value change, there's kind of line kind of passing around them. It's something that causes you to, I think, question everything you knew up until this point. The interesting thing about that is that when you move to working from three dimensions after copying Bargs, there is even more of a shock because essentially nature is so full of variety uh, that it beggars comparison to even kind of consider what we are able to kind of document on a drawing, especially in a strictly observational sense. One of the things that I think is kind of cool to do with this, actually, is to perform a bit of a, an experiment. So let's go ahead and look at this shadow shape, 
with our eyes really wide open. I'm talking about like bug out your eyes as wide as you can possibly get them and look at all the value variation that you can find inside of this shape. I picked out like six or seven different values. I can see, you know, so many different ones. You know, I can just keep going through and creating a, a more and more deep and rich and kind of complex value scale there um, the, the more I look at it. Now let's also, I'm, I'm even gonna, I have a rolling chair in my office here. I'm gonna roll my chair back, right, from my screen. I'm gonna squint way, way, way down. I'm almost looking at this through my eyelashes. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna trace a line around this shadow edge. Now, what you're seeing, what I know that you're seeing, because I can see it too, is that actually there is sufficient unity in this shape to still encapsulate it as a single shape, right? I can still see and watch all those diverse values that I was just talking about. I can see all of them actually kind of group together and in a way slightly simplify. So he's kind of balancing this razor edge in between how much variety you can have within a shadow and still have it read as a shadow. This for you should be a massive lesson to, to kind of document and to learn and understand. When you're working in a shadow shape, it's not important that it's totally unified. Uh, remember, we need to express the subject, but it's important that it's unified enough that when we kind of squint down, when, he, when we give it that test, right, by squinting down and looking at it in relationship to everything else, it should still unify. Let's look at that leg over here and see if we find the same thing. When I squint down and look at that, actually, the boundary of unified value is actually really quite distinct, right? It has soft edges, but, but nonetheless, when I squint down, the values inside of that shadow tend to unify. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do this now. But the next time that you go into your work, whether you're working on a portrait or you're working on a drawing or maybe you're even working on a barg, look at the values that you've indicated in terms of shadow, right? When you open your eyes, do you see variety there that helps describe the specificity in the form? And when you squint your eyes, do you see that those values also similarly bond together? Developing this taste and this skill for seeing is an integral part in what this phase of your education needs to end up doing. Starting with an envelope shape, one of the things that that does is it starts you out with this mentality of working from the outside in, so that you would start all of your conceptions of the subject from the outside. Uh, and so a great emphasis is placed on, on you know, creating complexity from the blocking that you have, and if the blocking that you have is 99% exterior, then that's where you'll search for your complexity. And I'll tell you why that caused me a problem before I tell you the solution. Uh, that caused me a problem because this is a very subtle undulating line with a dozen or so angle breaks. And I'm just talking literally about this section right through here. Caused me no end of, uh, of, of kind of worry and, and exhaustion in attempting to make it right. The day that it started to make sense was the day that I started to use, instead of just the contour, uh, that I started to use overlaps. This actually is, in a way, quite an easy part of the drawing to make. It, it, it's not hard, provided that you're using overlaps. Uh, so there was a massive difference, I think, experientially in between drawing with overlaps and drawing without them. I think it kind of marked forever, for me, a little bit, the, the difference in between the two. Now. Overlaps is still like a contour-centric idea, right? Because we, what I mean to say is we, we tend to find all the overlaps around the edges here. But what is an overlap really doing? An overlap is going from one side of something into the form. Let's go all the way across the form here, actually. And let's search for where that overlap kind of ends up, where those forms eventually go, right? They go to the other side of the subject. They start to talk about the way that one form and another form are mirrored on one side and then on the other. Uh, this is where it becomes kind of quite fascinating. You start to draw, uh, in a way, the entirety of the volume. So this is going to be a very quick introduction to the useful parts of what I think Loomis can offer us. Now, Loomis himself, Andrew Loomis, was a fantastic teacher, uh, draftsperson, and uh, 
you know, amazing, it was world renowned. Everybody knows Loomis, right? Uh, I don't need to, to, to indicate a whole bunch of, or, or use a bunch of superlatives to describe him because everybody knows about him and that's why, you know, how we know he's great. The point I want to make is this. I used to write off Loomis a bit because I thought that it was something most useful for like animators and illustrators who needed to make something out of nothing. Whereas if you had the raw material, the source image, the, the live model in front of you, you could simply draw from that and uh, you didn't need his kind of shorthand. This was at least what I was kind of taught in school and I've come to understand something very different since then. You know, the essence of what Loomis was teaching is a way to get us from zero to something with a kind of order to it, right? When we have a blank paper, we have nothing in front of us, we have ultimately complete chaos. So to go from nothing into a fully rendered head is not really a realistic proposition for an artist or a student for that matter. There has to be steps in between. These kind of three steps essentially are what your drawing of a head can look like after about 10, 15 minutes of study. Now, Loomis has really a lot to say about, uh, about the logic behind his process, and, and it's really kind of fantastic in terms of how he worked himself into this position as far as like understanding how to start a drawing, right? There's a lot of different ways, but one of the things I found really interesting actually was that he talked about the same idea that I, that I kind of espouse, which is, could you start off drawing a head by drawing a square around it? For sure, you could. You could definitely do that and you could start to chop away the excess to kind of create the uh, eventual shape that would represent the, the cranium and so on. But if you did start with that square, would you really be describing the subject? Is there not another equally simple geometrical shape that actually would much better describe a head at its, at its simplest state? Well, in a way, there absolutely is. So he opted for the circle which very rapidly, when you put a center line onto it, becomes a sphere, right? It becomes something with a volume. So you can imagine the center line traveling around back behind the sphere. And this is a big theme in Loomis's work, right? What we see traveling up one side, right? Eventually, that goes back around the back of the subject, and it's still going on. He describes it as a kind of rubber band on the surface of the, of the object, as, as, as a way to kind of think about it. The language that he uses, I think, is very important, too. It talks about how you need to think about the head. Because our representation here is essentially very symbolic. I mean, you know what a head looks like. It doesn't look like this. So this is a very symbolic representation of the head. But what it's meant to show us is essentially the shape of the cranium. And with the attachment of, uh, as I've done here, a front plane uh, and a side plane for the jaw, and uh, the very important and characteristic Loomis feature, uh, this ellipse at one side, we very quickly get to the place where our drawing is no longer completely symbolic, right? This, if you just came across this knowing nothing about drawing, you could essentially intuit that very likely this was there to represent a head. Now, that seems a very low bar to set for uh, our, our illustration, but when you consider that this Loomis head should take place again in the first 10 to 15 minutes of your drawing. Depending upon how, how long you've practiced it, maybe the first five minutes of your drawing can be, uh, can be consumed in making an illustration that is this simple of the head. The stages that it should go through, right? This would be essentially the first stage, a circle, then developing a center line, and I'll say also, uh, I sh maybe I should have added to this, but I I'll, I'll add to it now, the addition of this ellipse is what begins the essential trajectory towards uh, becoming a head because it's the idea of starting to show like the front plane here and the side plane here. It's how we begin to, to give uh, a head-like dimension. Now, this little section here is what I find actually so important in it because what it's representing is essentially the edge of the frontal bone of the forehead, right, of the skull, which corresponds roughly with the temporal line. Uh, I also went ahead and put a skull here so that the, uh, the Loomis block-in can kind of act as an overlay over the top of it. And this is actually one of the places where, you know, like if you look at my, my generic Loomis head here, it actually doesn't correspond to the, the equal kind of thirds. Uh, also because I was kind of drawing it to show this skull, which, which by the way, from the bottom plane of the nose where it reaches the front plane of the muzzle, 
uh, to the, the bottom of the chin is significantly longer than the, uh, the middle third. So just to say, you know, in every instance, you're going to find that variety and you should find that variety. That's the way it's supposed to work. That is kind of the basis for it. And I wanted to just take a moment. This is going to be the briefest thing. Guys and girls, I promise I'm not going to keep you there forever or here forever. <laughs> but I established basically the, the Loomis head proportion model here on top of him. And you can see that, that it tends to correspond in some places. Now, this is where it starts to correspond, I think, with what, what I generally do is I've attached on the kind of indications of the, uh, the lines of the jaw on the front plane of the face, but I've taken a moment to make it just a little bit more complex, including the uh, labella in it, including also this kind of low point to try to bridge the gap a little bit in between the zygomatic bone on one side and the kind of zygomatic bone on the, on the other side, just so we, again, like we get something that's like as real as, as possible out of this. I mean, obviously it's all a bit um, abstract, but where we can take the care to make it less so it's useful. Also, I indicated something that, that much more shows the, uh, the orientation of the kind of three planes of the forehead rather than the typical kind of Loomis line, which is that kind of hairline uh, indication, uh, which I didn't find as much useful. And then also, you know, my own kind of, the, the next thing that I generally add to a block in is this model for the, uh, the planes of the nose. So we have uh, one, two, and eventually around the other side, uh, three planes of the nose. We have the bottom plane that's also kind of split into uh, three sections and a horizontal indication of the mouth and the outside corners of the mouth, just so that we know like kind of where that boundary is and also that the, the mouth is not like literally a, a line or a slit in the face. It has a lot of forms uh, that are interacting with it around it. And thank you all for watching it. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to go have a, a glass of wine or something and, uh, you know, put a fire in the fireplace and, and relax. So, so thank you so much for being here. Take care.